inscribe your heart on history's page. first song. As we sing, I invite you to use this song as a prayer as we start, inviting the Spirit to come, fall on you afresh, fill you to fall on us together. Let's sing.
sing, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit Lord, we ask that your spirit would once again fill this place and fill our hearts. Mould us, fill us, use us. Help us to become more and more your people. Your hands and feet in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take a seat as we come to our time of confession. So let's just have a few moments to call to mind anything you particularly want to seek God's forgiveness for this week, anything that's troubling your hearts and want to find peace for. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will in our lives. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. The almighty and merciful God grant you pardon and forgiveness of all your sins. Time for amendment of life and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As God's forgiven people, we're going to declare our faith. So, let us declare our faith together. We believe that God has come to us, that God brought us into being, that God came to us as a particular human being, that Jesus Christ made our salvation complete. We believe that God is coming to us, that God is not happy to leave us alone, that this God will give us the presence of the Spirit to continue his work, that God will empower us to be disciples to all the corners of the earth. We believe that God will come to us, that God will have the final word, and that word will be good, that the day is coming when tears and pain will be no more, that all will gather at the table to sing an endless and perfect alleluia. We're going to light our second candle. So, ooh, it's a long 
way down when you was talking. That's right. Oh. We lit the first candle to pray for hope. We light the second candle to pray for peace. Peace for ourselves and the whole world. We ask for the peace of mind that comes from seeing things clearly. We pray for everyone who lives in the midst of conflict or war, that they may find some sign of peace that shines like this candle's light. Lord Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts and in all the world. Come close to us this hour. Um. We're going to sing a song now that may not be that familiar to some of us. The reason I picked it is because in the bridge, <laughs> that's the weird bits that you get in some songs that aren't the verse or the chorus. There's a line that says, break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. At the moment, it's Advent. And at Advent, we remember that God comes to us in the past, the present, and the future. And today, we're going to be thinking a bit about what does it mean for God to come to us in the present? And part of what that means is that we become more like him. So we ask that God breaks our hearts for what breaks his. That we see the world through his eyes. So let's stand and sing, I see the King of glory.
Amen. Do please take a seat. I'll collect for today. Almighty God, purify our hearts and minds that when your Son, Jesus Christ, comes again as Judge and Saviour, we may be ready to receive him, who is our Lord and our God. Amen. Our reading for today is from Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's just pray as we start, shall we? Lord God, we do pray that as we look at your word together this Advent, you would enable us to understand it and grow in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're looking at Romans 13, 11 to 14. Right. Um, I'll be honest with you. These days when I wake up in the morning, my main thought is how much I'd like to stay in bed. Um, I don't know how, mu- how familiar you are with that feeling, but it's a feeling I get almost every morning. However, a long time ago, I was a child. Some of you, it was even longer ago, but let's not talk about it. It was a long time ago, I was a child, and I remember that feeling of waking up um, at four or five in the morning, light streaming through the window, and desperately wanting to get up. I'm wondering why my parents didn't realise that the day had started. Come on, parents, get up. Do you remember that feeling? And you'd go down and it would be me and my brother, Peter, and we'd be watching the Saturday morning cartoons because we didn't have on-demand in those days. Do you remember those? Do you remember then? So the Saturday morning was the time when it would be things like Sharky and George on the TV. Anyway, never mind. These amazing cartoons that you'd watch on the TV and you'd be sat there watching them thinking, come on, parents, get up. The day has started. Can you not get on with it? While my parents just snored in their room. Now, obviously, I'm the guy now who is the parent snoring in the room, but be that as it may, that feeling of, come on, the day started, why are you not getting up, is the feeling that Paul is trying to use in this passage, this idea that the day has started, come on. He's talking about how, and the metaphor, the picture he's using is the idea that this, the night time, or the present age as he calls it earlier on in the letter that may still be rumbling on but the first rays of the new morning have started the new creation has started the new life has started the new age and it's time to get up and get dressed and get on with the day and yet some people are still kind of slumbering in bed as though it's still night time but he's calling us to wake up and get on with it um, and those, basically he's turning around to those who follow Jesus, though, you know, the Jesus whose life and death and resurrection has inaugurated that new age. Because of what he's done, the new age has started, and he's calling us to wake up and stop living in the darkness, but now start living in this new world this new morning and so he starts the you know the passage is all about that the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because your salvation is nearer now than when we first believed and he 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 starts off the metaphor by using things that do tend to happen at night the night is nearly over the day is almost here so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light let us behave decently as in the daytime not in carousing and drunkenness 
The idea is that, of course, most people get drunk at night, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. But by the end of the list, you can see that uh, it's the metaphor starting to break down with Paul because people get jealous all through the day, not just at night time. And dissension um, is a poor word we don't, it's basically a bad temper. And I know plenty of Christians with a bad temper, you know. And they, uh, they happen again all the way through the day, not just at night time. But this is, this is the idea that he's getting at. And then he calls us to basically get dressed. Rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Earlier on he talks about putting on the armour of light. It's wake up and get dressed. Get dressed for the daytime. Clothe yourselves with Jesus. Put on the armour of light. Um, which actually brings us to the main thrust of what Paul is trying to talk about in this passage. What Paul is basically saying is that he's calling us all to become more like Christ. We're all called to become more like Christ. We're all called to clothe ourselves with Jesus, to put on the armour of light. And it's not a particularly um, popular <laughs> message at the moment, but it is at the heart of Scripture that we are called to try and form ourselves more and more into Christ's likeness. Because the message tends to be in our culture, you're great just as you are. Which is a certain truth to it. God loves you just as you are. And God did not make a mistake when he made you, you. God needed, God designed, God planned for there to be a, a pat in the world, a, a masood in the world, a Ellie in the world, a rose in the world, whatever. He planned that. He didn't make a mistake when he made you, you. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that God just kind of goes, great, stay as you are then. God wants you to become the perfect you that he designed you to be. The you that he always envisaged and planned. This is the way Philip Yancey puts it. God loves you exactly as you are and loves you way too much to leave you that way. And I do think the world needs to wake up to this. Telling people that they're great as they are when they're miserable is a horrible thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But we were told that in the Western world all we needed to do was if we just figured out enough and we were just brave enough and just clever enough then we'd sort everything out and everyone would be happy. And yet the truth is that the Western world has more depression than ever. Our suicide rates continue to soar. The truth is that loads of people have more stuff than they've ever had before and they're miserable. <laughs> and part of that is that we are called. Yes, God made us as we are and yes, God loves us as we are, but we're still called to try and develop. We're still called essentially to develop our character, to become more Christ-like. And there's a reason, if we go back to the beginning, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And why at the beginning he says this, then God said, let us make humankind in our own image, in our own likeness. God makes human beings and he makes them in his image. And that image still continues. You can see that as you go through. That image is still there. That's why we believe in the sanctity of life. That's why we believe that every single person is worthy of respect and, and honour and, and why we believe that when we serve those who are forgotten, we are serving Christ himself because they're made in the image of God and that's vitally important. But that image is, is marred, 
right? It's, it's messed up. When you look at me, you don't see the perfect image of God. Trust me. All right? You see a messed up version of it. A tarred kind of... That's not to say the image of God isn't there. It's just, it's like a, a dirty mirror, you know? It's, it's not perfect. But this is where Christ comes in. Because Christ is what? Well, how about these verses? He's the exact likeness of God. He's the image of the invisible God. The radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And there are more verses if we wanted them. Jesus is the image of God in flesh. He is the word made flesh, as we will be celebrating in a couple of weeks. He is the exact representation of God. You want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. We often do it the other way round. You've heard me say this before, but I think it's vitally important. We think we know what God looks like, and then we try and impose that on Jesus. The Bible always says, do it the other way round. Look at Jesus, and that will let you see what God's like. Start with Jesus. He's the exact representation of God's being, of God's likeness. Which, to go back to Genesis, means that Jesus is, the, is humanity done right. If that makes sense. He's the image of God only without it being tarred and distorted. He's the exact representation of God's being. Which is why Paul tells us, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a call to become truly human. I hope that makes some sort of sense. It's, it's a call to become who you were always meant to be. We are called to develop ourselves. And he says it, Paul says it all over the place. Here's another one. This is Ephesians 4. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, or to put on the new self, Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. It's that same image, isn't it? Of putting off the nighttime clothing, putting off the way of the old world and instead clothing yourselves with the image of the new world. Um, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. The call again and again is God calls you to develop your character. This isn't about becoming less you, by the way. It's not about developing your personality. <laughs> God still wants you to be you. It's about developing your character, which is something different altogether. It's about becoming more the kind of person that God wants us to be. It, it involves us becoming more and more the kind of person that Jesus talked about in the Beatitudes, for example. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Can I put my name in front of them? David is poor in spirit. David mourns. David is meek. David hungers and thirsts for righteousness. David is merciful. David is pure in heart. David is the peacemaker. Yeah. But that's the aim. It's about growing in the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Again, am I... Loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good. It depends what day of the week it is, right? But it's about seeking to develop those things. Um, the attitudes of love, um, you often hear these in marriage services, but it's actually not about romantic love, it's about the love a Christian has for everyone 
Agape love in the Greek. It's about growing in those attitudes. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Again, I wonder whether I could take my name and put that in. Again, try it with your name. David is patient. David is kind. David does not envy. David does not boast. (laughs) I have to laugh because it's so laughable. But that's the aim, right? To become that person that does not envy, that does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth, that always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, that never fails. And of course, what's really interesting, and this is why we're called to clothe ourselves with Christ, is that if you put Jesus' name there, it works. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. He does not dishonor others. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. Jesus keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Jesus never fails. Clothe yourselves with Christ. It's about growing, developing your character Clothing yourselves with Christ is about putting on these characteristics, seeking day by day to do it. This is how Peter puts it. This is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, you will keep from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is, as I come to land, how do we how on earth do we do that? Because it's a big ask, right? Some of us have been, you know, I've been a Christian for um, how long have I been a Christian? Right. Give me a second. Uh. 26 years there you go I've been a Christian for 26 years and I've still got a long way to go so how do we do it well first of all and this is the most important bit um, we don't the spirit does it it's the spirit that does the work God is in us, working within us, transforming us. Moment by moment, day by day, God is transforming me. He's saving me, he's renewing me, he's, he's restoring me, he's clothing me with Christ. That's the first thing. It's the Spirit's job. You can't do it on your own. We acknowledge that to begin with. But, here's the thing. We have a... I was going to say we've got a very strange God, but that sounds slightly wrong when you say it, doesn't it? But we do, in one sense. We've got a God who, he never forces anyone. God never rapes, he woos and he calls. God never dominates. He instead, he he gently leads. That's the kind of God that we have. A God whose ultimate revelation to us is not parting the clouds with a booming voice and sending fire down from heaven, but is turning up as a baby to a poor teenage couple living a peasant life and dying on a cross, and then rising almost so that no one notices 
we've got a God who woos and calls and beckons and, and desperately pleads, please come, please come. And the Spirit transforms us in the same way. That's, by the way, if we go back to this passage, why Peter can say things like, make every effort. Make every effort. He, he talks about, um, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, try and have these things, this patience, this kindness, this love, this Christ-like character, try and have them in increasing measure. So we're, there's our effort in there. It's not so much effort. It's, like, it's, it's a bit like um, if, if, um, if the spirit is the shower head and we've still got to stick ourselves underneath the water. You know? <laughs> and it's no good standing in the sitting room complaining that the shower's not getting you wet. All right? <laughs> You've got, you, you, it's the shower that gets you wet, but you're going to have to go stand in the shower cubicle, guys. All right? You've got, you've got to put yourself there. Okay? So how do we do it? How do we put ourselves under the shower? How do we make it so the Spirit can do that work of transforming us? Well, I would propose these three. Um, word, people, and circumstances. Okay, word. Put basically, pray and study God's word. Read the Bible. Pray to God. Do it regularly. Do it daily. And I'm not going to lie, if you read it, um, there will be bits you don't understand. You know, I've spent... You know, I've spent what? But I, I, again, give me a second at least four or five years in kind of adult education studying the Bible and there are still bits that I read and think, what? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You won't get it all, but, this, but it's not just a book. It is alive and active and if you carry on reading it, God will somehow use it to help transform you and grow you and mould you and fill you. It is itself part of the process so be reading it. And even if you don't understand it, trust that if you do it, drip by drip by drip, it will do its work in you. So keep praying, keep studying, keep doing it. And you will find gradually that you become more and more Christ-like. Um, you know, that's, that's what this is. That's what sanctification is. Sanctification is the posh um, theological word for this process of developing your character sanctification and that's the difference by the way salvation is instantaneous and takes no effort from our part God saves you immediately but sanctification takes longer and is much more effort it's about God developing your character so word, pray, read the Bible second, people the church trust me, I work for it and the church can be incredibly frustrating. Not you guys, obviously. But the church in general can be. It's all sorts of messed up. And do you know why? Because it's full of human beings. And human beings are messed up. And we make mistakes and we get things wrong. And we think we know what we're talking about when we really don't. And we, it's all sorts of mixed up. I know that. But it's still part of the process. The Christian family. Again, you know, like I say, the Bible can be difficult and frustrating and hard to understand. Trust me, that's even more the case for the church. But, beside, but that's beside the point. We're called to be part of it. Do not neglect meeting with, with others. That's Hebrews 10.25. Do not neglect meeting with each other. And I get that it's hard at the moment. More than ever before, some people are staying away because of COVID. Some are worried and scared, and I get it. Some people, and it's amazing how much if you go around, you'll get people saying, well, I am a Christian, but I don't go to church. I, I pray and I read the Bible, and that's enough. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I've heard that sentence a million times. And to a certain extent, it's true. But it's a bit like the sentence, you don't have to live together to be married. Or you don't have to spend time with your children to be a father. 
I mean, it's technically true, but you've totally missed the point. Right? <laughs> if you're saying that sentence, you've got really mi- mixed up somewhere. Coming to church should be a priority for Christians. It should be a priority. And I'm aware that more than ever it will make me unpopular saying that. But it's true. And if you want to develop your character, if you want to become more and more Christ-like, the Bible itself tells us again and again, part of that journey is being part of a Christian family. And all the rough and tumble and mix-up that comes with that and the frustration is all part of it. Which brings us, of course, to the third one in my little list, circumstances. God uses our circumstances to form us more into Christ. Whatever difficulties come along, and again, I've said this a million times, but I'm not saying God sends these difficulties. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is whatever difficulties come along, whatever trials come along, God can and will use them if you let him. Whatever trouble comes along, try asking yourself this question. Okay, what is God trying to teach me with this? What is, if when you find someone really, really annoying, not that that ever happens to me, obviously, but, of course it does, when you find someone really, really annoying, try praying, okay, God, thank you for sending this teacher into my life. What are you trying to teach me through this person? There's a great scene with that amazing theologian, Morgan Freeman. He, (laughs) in, um, what's what's the follow-up to Bruce Almighty? Evan Almighty, Evan Almighty, have you seen it? Um, He calls Evan and Evan has to make an arc. It's funny, it's good. Um, And at one point, the wife just despairs of Evan, who's gone nuts and he's grown a beard and he's building this arc in the middle of, I can't remember, somewhere in America. And, um, (laughs) <laughs> and she goes to this cafe as she's leaving with the kids and Morgan Freeman who of course is the God character um, poses as a, um, a waiter in a cafe and uh, he starts talking to her and he essentially says to her something along the line I won't get the quote perfect when you pray for God to make you more patient do you think God zaps you with patience? Or do you think he puts you in circumstances where you have to be patient? When you, if someone was to pray for a closer, more loving family, do you think God zaps you with loving feelings? Or does he give you opportunity to love one another? It's a wonderful little scene. Go and watch it. It's great. YouTube it or something. This is actually the point. Your circumstances, they can teach you to be more patient. They can teach you to be more loving. They can teach you all sorts of things if you just let them. It's all part of God's forming of your character. Which does bring us to now, which I'd like to just say very briefly. We are in Advent. Advent is not um, the countdown to Christmas. Although, of course, it is before Christmas, obviously. Um, But the Advent is actually the time when the church, and I say this every year, the church reminds itself that we are supposed to be expecting God to come. We are expecting God to turn up. And that's past present and future we are expecting this is why in advent you get readings about the second coming because we are expecting christ will come again and restore and renew and redeem all things and we live in expectation of that and in the past of course when christ, when god came to us through his prophets and ultimately of course in the form of his son Jesus, who then lived and died and rose again for us. He came, and he has come in the past throughout history, and he's come in the past in your life. 
right? God has turned up and done stuff in your life. The very fact you're here this morning, think of all the circumstances in life that resulted in you being here today, this morning. God has worked in your life to bring you to this point. God is working in the past, but he also works in the present. And that's what character development is all about. It's about faith that God can and will turn up by his spirit and do that work in your heart, in your mind, in your soul. Right? God can and will, by his spirit, form you more and more like Christ, clothe you with Christ. And so at Advent, we expect it. We remind ourselves that we are expectant for God to do this work. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. So my brothers and sisters, wake up. The hour has come. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. It's time to get dressed. Clothe yourselves with Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, help us not just to say these things, not just to come to church on a Sunday, but to seek to live them out in all we do and say. Lord, clothe us afresh with your Son, that we ourselves can live a life that reflects you. Purify us, Lord. Redeem and restore us, moment by moment, day by day. Amen. We're going to sing, Purify My Heart. Shall we stand? Purify my heart, let me be as old and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as gold.
Yes, Lord, help us not just to sing those words, but to mean them. We choose to be holy. We choose to be set apart for you, our master. We declare that we are ready to do your will. Purify us. Make us like you. Amen. Please do take a seat. We can have the next slide, please. When I say your kingdom come, please respond, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Holy God, ever with us and ever on your way towards us, we look to you this Advent, willing your kingdom to come, but knowing it's not ours to take. So come to us. Come to us in the many guises of your love. Meet us in our longing. Enter our waiting. Give life to our hoping. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Advent God, hope of the hopeless. You alone give us reason to go on. Give hope to those who this day all over the world are hungry for basic gifts. Food to stop children aching with hunger. A home to put pictures on the wall. Education to open the door to a job. Justice to give everyone a chance. Health to keep families together. We pray particularly for all those things that are on our hearts and minds ever from our own, either from our own personal lives or from the news, as we call them to mind now. God of hope, give hope to the hopeless. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Advent God, love of the loveless, you are the one who never fails to love to the limit. You love without question the loveless, the unlovely and the unlovable. May we do the same. We're aware of people or groups of people whom we instinctively reject because of what they've done to us or for us or what they represent to us. We identify them in our hearts now. Give us strength to love. Give them strength to respond. And give us the gentleness to love ourselves as well. God of love, give love to the loveless. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Advent God, joy of the joyless. You are the source of inex inexhaustible delight. In a world of desperate pleasure and strained smiles, take us to the place where true joy can be found. We pray for those who face Christmas and the new year with apprehension knowing it to be a time where much true poverty is revealed. Be it financial poverty or poverty in love or friends or purpose or spirit. In silence, we pray for particular families, maybe even including our own. God of joy, give joy to the joyless. Your kingdom come, your will be done. 
Advent God, God of those who think themselves godless, you are the rock on which our lives are built. Have mercy on those who try to live without you and lead them gently to the truth that sets us free. Come afresh to the minds of those who think they've thought their way out of your reach. Come afresh to those of us who think we have it all sorted out, for whom your mystery and power have become dulled and routine. Come afresh to the hearts of us all, whether they be full of distractions or swept clean and empty. We long for you to be the centre of our lives and the centre of the life of the world. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Holy God, this Advent we set ourselves to longing again, longing and waiting and hoping. We long for your kingdom to come and for this world to be transformed. For it to be on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the glimmerings of that new world. Have us also to become real in us. So come our Advent God with the promise of a new birth in Jesus Christ our Lord. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God, we give you thanks, because you sent your Son Jesus to redeem us from sin and death, and to make us inheritors of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may with joy behold his appearing, and in confidence may stand before him and with saints and angels praise you, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night before he died, Jesus had supper with his friends. And taking bread, he gave you thanks. He broke the bread. Gave it to them and said, Take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me when supper was ended he took the cup of wine and again he gave you thanks he gave it to them and said drink this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. I can only imagine 
what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. To my knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all, I can only imagine, I can only imagine.
what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak? We say together, generous God, you have fed us at your heavenly table, set us on fire with your spirit, that when Christ comes again, we may shine like lights before his face, who with you and the spirit lives forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
Would you like to take a seat? Okay. Right, some notices. First of all, I'll repeat the notice that we gave at the beginning. Um, with the new restrictions that have come in, we've had to put back on our risk assessment that we will keep our masks on throughout the service, please. Um, so can I make sure you're aware of that for the future? Thank you. Hopefully you all understand and it's just as annoying to me as it is everyone else and I'm uh, aware that singing with masks on is not the best thing in the world. Obviously if you have a medical exemption that's something different. Um, right, um, can I have the doofa? My long-suffering wife, thank you. Right, um, notices. Um, I would just like to say first of all that our mission partners, um, Andre and Alina, who um, work in Brazil, um, do work in Brazil that we sponsor, they've just had their first baby, Julia. So, there you go. I know Andre particularly watches pretty much every week, so Andre, we're sending all our love to both of you, well, all three of you, I should say. God bless you. Um, they have also put a new initiative together, which um, I'd ask you to look out for. Um, the idea is that you can sponsor an individual child out in Brazil for £7 a month. So if that's something you might be interested in, watch this space. Um, I'm going to show you a video, which hopefully the sound is going to work, as he looks to the sound desk. <laughs> Do you know what answer I got? <laughs> so that's good, isn't it? Right, here we go. Um, this is something that a whole bunch, you'll have heard me talk about Vision Wakefield before. Vision Wakefield is a group of Christian leaders across Wakefield and we're working together to try and bless Wakefield in whatever way we can. So here's just a quick video explaining some of that. Hopefully. We can do so much more together. That's what we as Christian leaders in Wakefield, including the Bishop, have been finding as we've worked together closely for 18 months now. Last year's Christmas video was just one of the outputs from the now 29 workshops we've had together. In a moment, you'll see what else has been happening. This Christmas, we've been partnering with the Cross Project to connect schools with the Christmas message. As we've all been learning, we can do so much more together. Now, over to those who've been doing all the hard work. Wakefield is a city brimming with history, art and culture. With creativity and initiative. Like every city though, it has its pain points too. But together we can see more of God's kingdom released in our communities, in our families, in our businesses and on our streets. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Last Christmas, the churches came together as one to bless Wakefield with a Christmas card in every letterbox, a prayer line, digital vans displaying the Christmas message, and a drive-in carol service that was enjoyed by so many. We produced an online Christmas service showcasing the incredible work happening in Wakefield. One viewer even said, this is the first time I have ever felt proud to live in Wakefield. Now that was amazing to hear. We've done lots of projects throughout the year with your support. The Real Love Initiative. Love is people caring about other people. We've also done 24 seven prayer for the whole of Wakefield. We've done 50 answers to prayer on video, which were wonderful. 
and we've also done even a prayer walk together. And we couldn't have done any of this without you. Well, this Christmas, in partnership with The Cross Project, we are working with schools in Wakefield. Year 7 children will be competing to design a card that reflects God's love. You'll see those wonderful winning Christmas cards on digital vans around Wakefield in the week leading up to Christmas. The winning card will be distributed throughout Wakefield and to asylum seekers in the city. As a city of sanctuary, we want people arriving here to feel welcomed and loved. So we're throwing a Christmas party for asylum seekers and refugees in the cathedral. We would like to thank everybody that has given gifts for the asylum seeker children for this Christmas party. And we trust that they're going to love them. We are one in him and are called as his church to be united in love so that we can love the unloved and reach the unreachable through Christ. Together, we can do so much more. We need your prayers and your support for these initiatives. Please do speak to your church leader and see how you can get involved. The momentum is building and it's all coming together. It's all coming it's together. All coming together. And and it's all coming it's together. All coming it's together. all coming together. It's 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 all coming together. Love is coming together. If church leaders can do that together, just what can churches as a whole do if we all come together to express the love of Christ for the city? The leaders would love you to be thinking and praying about this. And if you feel there's more you want to do to bless our city next year, please let us know. There's also the Vision Wakefield website that we'll be updating throughout next year, so do keep an eye out for that too. So from us at Vision Wakefield, the peace of Christ to you this Christmas. The reason I show you that is because I want you to see that, number one, the churches are working together and this isn't just something we want leaders to do. We want us all to feel that we are part of this movement. Our longing is that the Christians of Wakefield will be together and will be an open door to working together to bless this city and see Christ proclaimed as Lord throughout the city in everything that goes on. We want to, we've done things like Christians in politics and trying to work with the council, not to kind of come in and go, you need to be with us, but how can we work with you to help where help is needed in this place? How do we come together as one body? And that is something that we need everyone to be part of. So thank you for things like all those people that sewed hearts back when we did the heart sewing. Thank you for those who have given presents for the refugee party. And I see there's more on the back shelf and I know more people have bought some in today. Thank you for those people that did things like turn up for the driving pardon me, driving carol service. I hope you found it an enjoyable thing at the time. Thank you for those who came to the prayer walk where we walked around and prayed around the city, in the local, uh, around this kind of area here, stopping at different churches. All of this is part of the story of us coming together where Jesus prayed that we would be one. So I ask you, first of all, to listen out for those things and where you can join in with them. We're hoping to do even more next year together. I'm asking you to go check out the website and you'll see a whole bunch of other things that we've done during the year. So it's visionwakefield.co.uk and I'm asking you to pray. Please do pray because I do think that this is an answer to, God's, uh, to Jesus' prayer on the night he was betrayed that we would be one, that the world will know and believe. So please do be praying for that. It's an amazing initiative and I think the spirit is very much involved in it. Right. Christmas. That's right, it's coming everyone. Um, there are two leaflets on the baptistry at the back. One looks like this. That details our Christmas services. You can pick them up at the back. And one looks like this, and this is our family carol service on Christmas Eve. I invite you to pick up leaflets on the way out, and I invite you to pick up more than one. 
because then you can invite someone else. So take more than one and then go up to someone else and say, would you like to come to this service and I'll be there as well and I'll join you. Okay? Nothing to lose. They're at the back. Do pick them up on the way out. I think that's all my notices. I said, he says, mentally quickly running through his brain. I always forget at least one thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A blessing. Let's have our final blessing. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you. Scatter the darkness from your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you and all those you love and pray for this Advent season and forevermore. Amen. We go into the world to walk in God's light, to rejoice in God's love, and to reflect God's glory.